Put your hands together and please welcome Laszlo Bock. Laszlo, come and join me, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah. Fair to say I've been waiting to do this for years. Having spoken about Google and its culture for many, many years, I'm really keen to find out this can't all be true. Can it? I think, um, you know, I, I think from the outside, uh, and I get this question all the time. I had, um, from the outside, it's all bean bags and lava lamps and free food, right? People say, like, you know, do they get any work done? What's going on? I got a call uh, after, maybe a year or two after I got the job from a colleague who, um, who said, you know, our CEO wants to be as innovative as Google. I said, okay. And they said, what do we need to do? And I said, well, why don't you um, try actually being more transparent and maybe record the CEO's staff meetings and let anybody in the company watch them so they know what's happening? Well, uh, he wouldn't like that. What if you have junior people in the room to kind of take notes and then be sort of emissaries and explain how decisions get made? No, 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 it's very confidential. What if, what if you do an all-hands meeting where anyone can ask questions. Mm, what if it's a dumb question and he get no, we couldn't do that. And we go down the list and down the list, down the list. Suggestion box, no, wouldn't like it. Um, and finally I said, you know, good luck with the beanbags. Um, <laughs> because what, what makes Google work is not all that stuff. It's a mission um, that people can aspire to. And there's a tremendous amount of high quality academic research that says when you give people a mission and people find meaning in almost any job, janitorial jobs, housekeeping jobs, people find meaning in any kind of job, it's possible. And connect that to the work they do, they're more productive, they're happier, they stay with you longer. So having a mission So does that is mission important. change? What is the mission of Google at the moment? So the mission is organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. I remember my first meeting with Eric Schmidt. So I had all the good GE training, and so I sit down with Eric, who's our CEO, and uh, you know, he says, what do you think we should do? And I said, well, you know, two years out of the IPO, so we have a bunch of people who are economic volunteers, and they're just here because they want to be. We need to plan for succession. We need to look at, because somebody might decide to just retire tomorrow. We need to think about, um, you know, what do we need to lock people in if they've had this historic thing? And he looked at me, and he said, I think you're completely wrong. I don't think any of that stuff matters. I think we should focus on hiring the best people and building the best possible teams and not worry about retention and succession planning. If we have to do succession planning, something's gone wrong. And I thought, I have gotten off on the wrong foot. <laughs> so I, I But was, it didn't cross your mind to say I'm at the wrong place. No, no, it didn't. No. It was quite the opposite, actually, yeah, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So his vision, yeah. his dream, which is quite a clear one. Yeah but let me say quite an odd one. Yes. Part of your role was to realize that yeah. as the organization grew. Yeah. Well, this was, this was a big lesson for me because, you know, in consulting you're taught, you go in, you solve the problem, and in your careers, you're successful because typically there's some problem, you go in, you figure it out, and, and you go solve it, right? And, you know, there's all this literature about you need a 30-day plan when you're in a new job. And, and the big lesson for me was you got to release your agenda. You know, when you come into a new role like that, particularly a company like Google, you have to focus on what the people around you think is important first, even if it's not the right stuff, because you have to build that credibility. And coming in, you know, they liked my background and they liked me, but if I were to say we need to focus on this problem, Eric explicitly said, you are wrong. And that was a beautiful part of the culture too, right? Like he wasn't being mean, he wasn't being cruel, he was just being honest. And so I had to find a way to build that credibility over time, and I did it by focusing on, okay, what, what's the most important thing? Well, recruiting, okay. So my first year was spent probably 70 or 80% on recruiting issues and how to make recruiting better. And from there, slowly, slowly, I was able to build kind of relationships and credibility. You talk about Googliness. Yeah. How would you define Googliness, this intangible thing you look for, Googliness? Well, so I try not to say the word because it's kind of like this weird, awful, like everything has to be Google, everything. Um, but um, it's a couple things. Uh, when we went from a recruiting perspective, and when I talk about it, and everyone has a little bit of a different definition, um, there's kind of three components. One is, do you bring something different to the party? So when we talk about our culture and wanting people to fit in, we don't want people who are like us. There's enough tech companies where everyone's the same and everyone's kind of a programmer and they have their own way of doing things and it's the same. We don't want that. We want people who bring something new to the party. Second thing is we want intellectual humility. Not regular humility. We have people with pretty big egos. 
And you know, some of it can get a little obnoxious, and you know, because eh, they're people, and that's what happens. But intellectual humility is the ability to recognize when you're wrong, the ability to recognize when you're presented with new facts that your views of the world should change in light of those new facts. You know, I was I was delighted when I came across research that said, you know, in any job you can connect to meaning, right? There's hope. There's this great story about um, a guy uh, in in New York City, and he works in a deli. And his job, this guy's been doing this for 10 years, his job is to slice lox. Do you call it lox here? Yes. Smoked salmon? Um, I'm still learning my language. Um, and that's what he's been doing for a decade in New York City. And uh, his name is Chapta Shinasa Sherpa. His last name is Sherpa because until he was sort of like 20 years old, he was in Tibet and he was a Sherpa. And he started at age 11, you know, sort of schlepping stuff up and down Mount Everest. And the journalist who interviewed him said, your job used to be helping people summit Everest, like achieve this incredible epiphany, this lifelong goal. You've been cutting fish for 10 years. Surely that's a step down. Surely that's a narrowing of scope. And he said, it's exactly the same thing because in both cases, I'm serving people. And trying to find that connection and then trying to have the science that says, here's how you do it. If you've got this kind of business problem, this is a proven way to fix that problem, to make people feel excited about what they do or to take bias out of your recruiting system or to pay people in a way that makes more sense and makes your best people feel even better. That's what I wanted to do. And you've done it fantastically. Please, please, please put your hands together. Laszlo Bork, fantastic. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you.